if you're writing that character and they and they want to do things to make them believable, you have to make them real people, which means they have to believe what they're doing. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Tim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Karen Travis. Thank you for listening to Author Stories. We are now more than 350 episodes in and not slowing down anytime soon. It's because of you, the loyal listeners who tune in each day to Author Stories to hear the best author interviews around, and I just wanted to say thank you. On the right-hand sidebar of the website at hankgarner.com, you can find links where you can subscribe to the show, and it helps other people find the show. The more people subscribe, the higher we go in the rankings, and the easier people find us. Uh, I'd like to thank some sponsors uh, this week for uh, for helping us bring the show to you. I, your humble host, I have a brand new book out. It's called The Pandora Codex. Oliver Weber, book one, A Closely Guarded Secret, A Stolen Artifact, and A Madman Trying to Open a Portal to Hell. Can Oliver Weber become the hero he's meant to be? Pick up the Pandora Codex now. It's the first book in the Oliver Weber series. The second book, Jacob's Ladder, comes out very soon. Go ahead, dig into this series. Grab it now. You won't be disappointed. Uh, my friend Patricia Gilliam has a new series called Series Craft 101, and she has a series uh, of books, uh, the fictional character creator workbook, setting and world building workbook. If you are looking to uh, to put together a long running series like Patricia has done, uh, these are some things that she's learned and that she can help you to get on top of that makes managing a long series uh, much easier. Go check it out. There's a link in the show notes, and we'll be talking about it more. Bokera Brumley has a new book called Imani Earns Her Cape. It's a middle grade novel. You might have heard us talk about it on the show uh, just a week or so ago when Bokera was on. A 12-year-old Imani should be celebrating the most important day of her life by eating myrrh fruit, casting fl- uh, flying spells, and laughing with her mother, but there's just one massive problem. Her mother's been kidnapped by a giant troll, and now Imani is lost in the Fey realm with no way home back to Virginia. Completing her rite of passage alone is inadvisable, but if Imani doesn't want to lose the only family she's ever had, she may have no choice. Transportal train travel, underwater cities, submarines, sea dragons, and unexpected family all combine in Imani earns her cape. Thanks for listening to the show. At the end, as always, we have an audiobook clip from my friend Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Uh, today, I'm really excited to have Karen Travis on the show with me. Today, uh, Karen is the author of numerous, uh, not only science fiction books, but science fiction series, and a lot of them I'm sure you are very familiar with. Uh, so Karen uh, has a new book out called Black Run. It's in the Ringer series, and that's an ongoing series, and we're going to talk all about that and uh, and everything that Karen's been up to in the show today. Welcome to the show, Karen. It's good good to be on the show. Well, thank you for having me, as they say. Well, thank you. Uh, Karen, uh, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Um, it was very recent. <laughs> <laughs> this is, yeah, sorry. Uh, I know everybody wants me to say, oh, uh, I'd always wanted to be a novelist from when I was little. No, <laughs> it really didn't work out that way at all. Um, I always want, wanted, I always wanted to be a journalist, which I was, uh, that started at an early age. And I'm not entirely sure, um, given the age I was when I said it to my mother, uh, that I knew what a journalist was, but that's what I wanted to be. I was a news reporter. That's what I did for, uh, I won't put any dates in it because then people will re- realize how very, very old I am. But <laughs> let's just say that I, that I was a news journalist one way or another for, should we just say over 20 years? Um, well, that, that counts whole, as writing. That counts as writing. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. It's, yeah. It's a storytelling. Although having, having said that, 
Um, journalism shapes how I write. So it's very difficult to draw the line b- between them. But I didn't actually uh, decide to write novels until a moment of desperation, uh, which is sort of the story of my life, really. Um, I'd ended up in uh, being head of uh, PR uh, for City Hall somewhere. And anyone who's worked in politics <laughs> knows that that's a, <laughs> that's a bit of a cesspit. Anyway, I, I really did stick with it for a long time. Uh, I did it for slightly more than 10 years. But I finally reached the end of my rope and thought, I can't do this anymore. And my my moment of revelation um, came when I was on – they'd put me on what we used to call the little chief execs course, you know, for senior managers that you were going to – uh, be groomed into the sort of person who could uh, who, who could sort of run cities, and I knew in my heart of hearts that this was just dumb. This is not what I wanted to do. I I was all right wrangling the media and things like that, but there was no way that I was ever going to be happy as a bureaucrat. I mean, frankly, would you want your city run by me? I mean, honestly, I was doing the world a favour, believe me. But part of this course uh, was that you got a bit of uh, a very expensive uh, career counselling, and I thought, well. I, I just can't go on with this. And in the career counselling session, I said, look, I'm wasting your time and money. Um, I'm, I'm not going to be uh, staying, in, staying in this sort of job. I just want out. I said, so use, use your time for someone who really does need the career counselling and is going to do something for the public, you know, rather than just sit here going, how can I get out of this job? And this guy, I'm pretty sure his name is Malcolm McGreevy, and I owe him a debt of gratitude if he's, if he's still out there somewhere, if by any remote chance he's listening. He said, well, no, he said, that, that is a valid use of my time. Let's think about what we can do to find you a different career. And we went through the whole thing. Do you want to go back to news journalism? No. Uh, have you got any hobbies? And I said, well, not really. <laughs> and we went through this, and you could see him thinking, "There is nothing I can do with this woman other other, other than you know, you know suggest she goes to a nunnery or something." And and eventually, um, I, I just, it just I forgot to tell him I occasionally write fiction. Had no intention of being published, just occasionally did it out of curiosity. And he said, "So you actually do write fiction?" I said, "Well, I wouldn't say I write a lot of fiction." Um, <laughs> he said, "Look, um, I hate to say this, but..." You've earned your living as a writer for a very long time. Uh, you know how to do a business plan. You know how to run a business. Uh, you've been a manager, you know, spending a lot of money. Um, why can't you put those together and actually make a career out of fiction? And there was this sort of cartoon light bulb went on over my head, and I thought, do you know, he's got a point. So I just wrote this business plan, this five-year plan, and I stuck to it. And um, I basically it will panned out only because i stuck to the plan but it was a very mechanistic thing there was a sense of relief and uh, um let's see my first first novel was published in 2004 and by the end of that year i'd gone writing full time but that was purely a chance comment by someone looking at it from the outside who said to me there are other things that you can do with your life so i never thought of being a novelist and for some people find that a heartening story because they realise that you know you can get opportunities coming down the pike at you at any time, and others think it's dreadful that it wasn't my lifelong dream. <laughs> That's the truth. Well, no, no. Um, I, I there's so many, so many threads to unravel uh, out of the story so far. Um, one, um, why do you think you were fascinated with journalism at such a young age? Do, do you have any recollection of of uh, of why that seemed to be uh, a good idea or maybe a glamorous idea what do you, could you trace that back to uh to anything that might have triggered that in a in a young child do you know i've i've often i've often wondered that i mean i come from uh despite the fact i'm trying to be slightly more my sort of radio presenter voice today <laughs> i come from a very very blue collar background very blue collar i come from a very very rough part of a very rough city um and i and i'm proud of that um, yeah. My parents had, I mean, I was brought up on a council estate, um, what you'd call a project. Uh, um, I was taught to read before I, I went to school. You know, my mother insisted that I could read. I read newspapers. I didn't always un- un- understand, obviously, what I was reading in a newspaper at that age. But um, I I grew up with 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 a facility for language, I, I think. My mother and father never spoke to me as if I was a child. If I didn't understand something, I had to look it up. 
And they they were just ordinary working class people who had left school at like 14. So, you know, it's not as if I have I didn't come from that, uh, from the proper background. Um, my mother tells me, um, or told me because she's no longer with us, unfortunately, that uh, uh, I want to be a journalist. And I first mentioned it when I was six. I wanted to be a reporter. Now, I have no idea what was going through my head at that time. There are things I do remember from age five, uh, which are which are very, very vivid, but that you think I'd remember. But no, I just I just got on with it. And um, I I went, uh, I got a, sorry, I'll start again. I was lucky, despite coming from a very poor background in a very working class area, that we still had a grammar school system that you could enter by exams. You didn't have to live in the right area. You didn't have to have the right parents. Uh, if you could pass this exam, and score well, then you went to grammar school, and I did, and that changed my life, which is why I'm, which is why I defend uh, the grammar school and uh, sort of uh, merit system because it, it it gets poor kids like me yeah. out of poor areas where their expectations are low. It gives poor kids a break, and absolutely. it gave me a break. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, Karen, I've I've talked to a number of novelists who. Uh, began in journalism, and uh, one thing that I I, I, I ask them, and you alluded to this earlier, uh, is how do you feel like journalism shaped your fiction writing, and do you think that it gives you a unique view into the world that then allows you to uh, in, maybe in your world building because you're you're accustomed to looking for the unique details. Uh, that others don't see, because that's what good journalism does: is it gives us a view of the world and, and 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 of circumstances that we as bystanders didn't pick up on. Uh, yeah. So, so do do you feel like that's been a unique skill uh, that oh, totally. has helped you? Yeah. Yes. I mean, there are two things that have come. Well, there, there are a lot. Start again. Um, I never waste anything. Uh, I'm a great one for using up leftovers, and there is not one bit of my fairly varied work <laughs> life that I have not used and exploited. You know, I don't leave research on the table either. You know, right. if I've still got some pages that I've not used, there will be a novel based on that. You know, but yes, I mean journalism particularly. Um, I get emails from would-be writers saying, "What would you recommend? What college course uh, should I take?" And I say, "Don't live." Go out yeah. and live. But if you absolutely insist on a job, go and do something where you encounter people. And uh, journalism is one of them. Uh, I always say, you know, uh, join join the army or your service of choice. Uh, just get out and do things. Because if you think having an English lit degree and uh, or a creative writing degree is going to solve your problems, you can't write what you can't see. There And words on a paper. That's not storytelling. The thing about journalism for me, and I sort of really work it backwards, why I see the world differently be because I'm a journalist or I became a journalist because I see the world differently, whichever it was, is that I, I explore. The um, thing about journalism, news journalism, is that you come in in the morning and there is a story and then you've got to get to grips with it. You may never have dealt with that topic before. You may not have dealt with that person before. You have to explore. You've got to ask the questions, not give answers. Now, journalism today, I do not recognize that landscape. I do not reckon. And I have taught journalism and I've trained young journalists. I do. I saw the rot starting to set in the 80s. I do not recognize journalism today. It's activism. I don't care what you think. Leave your beliefs at the door when you come in my newsroom. You're there to be the eyes and ears of the public and to report back to them. And at its very basic, it's he said, she said. You know, uh, you are not their brain. You are their eyes and ears. And if you lose sight of that, you're not doing journalism. You're doing propaganda. And I've done propaganda too, remember. I've been in PR for, and I've worked for politicians, <laughs> so I know where the line is. But the thing about, the thing about journalism for me, uh, I, I treat fiction the same way. Um, if you just... This is why when I've written for other people's universes, I've said I don't want to see anything else anyone else has written any more than I would want to um, have someone tell me what they think of a person and for me to judge 
that person by someone else's opinion. I want to discover it. I want to walk in, into this world I've never seen before, treat it as if it's real, find out what's going on, and let the character speak. Now, this does go back to uh, what I was like as a kid. Now, if it's sort of do you know do a sort of dissolve back to when I was very very young is that I was always very curious about whether other people saw what I could see you know whether they saw color the same way whether things sounded the same to them um I know every, every kid must at some point go through a stage of working out where they end and the rest of the world starts but I was always very curious about how other people saw the world and there's <laughs> I sort of hes- I hesitate to use the word dissociation, but the way I deal with characters, because I can't interview real people <laughs> in fiction, I then have to create those people. And I was I was never a kid who had an imaginary friend. I mean, I don't know how I can do this because I was I'm not an imaginative person. I'm an I'm I'm an extrapolative person. But however it works, um, I can now take a character, treat them as a total stranger and step into their mind and it takes me places that I can't imagine. My characters are not me, they're not like me, they don't agree with me, they probably wouldn't even want to sit next to me on the bus, some of them. <laughs> but, you know, you, you, you get in these characters' heads and you see the world the way they see it and that, that for me is the thrill. In the same way it was as a journalist, I wanted to know what was going on. I didn't want my biases confirmed if someone says something that shocked me and changed my world, I wanted to hear it. I need to know what's real. I need to know the truth. And I use this phrase a lot about truth in fiction. Uh, I, I particularly apply it because I write military fiction. And that is, I want to tell the truth. There's too many lies out there and too much propaganda. And people, despite access to information, uh, are probably more shielded from certain si- sides of life than they ever were, say, in the 40s or 50s. Uh, And I'm just trying to say, look, this is what's happening. What do you think? And that's as far as I go with with a reader in the same way I did as a journalist. I found out this. I found out that. He says that. She says that. Now it's up to you to decide what you think is right or wrong, true or false. Um, Karen, I I absolutely agree with you about the – the way journalism has changed, not only uh, is it apparent that uh, we are being propagandized uh, from both sides and, and with everyone seems to come to the news with agendas uh, and and that's where they begin and then report from there. Uh, yes. But a, another interesting thing that I've noticed is it seems that we have lost um, – the the art of specialization you know, where you know each newspaper used to have uh like a a a, a police beat where mm, this person yeah. would be familiar with uh what goes on with the police department and and had contacts there and could then be almost a, a mediator or arbiter of between those two worlds mm. and and specialization seems to have gone by the wayside and that and now we just get these reports of he said she said because we don't have anyone reporting that actually understands what's going on that can then help the public understand um mm. it, it, you you talked about that that you write military fiction or military fiction as you would say um does does that um uh love of writing that sort of fiction come from your uh, what you were doing in journalism and maybe yes, things that yes. you saw and, and want to communicate? Yes, yes. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm just going back to something you said about the uh, the lack of specialization. Yes, that's true. And I've, I've seen that in my working lifetime. Uh, I, I, was, I was a defense correspondent on a regional paper. Uh, even then, there were only two of us in regional papers in the country, which is shocking. I mean, the rest were nationals. When you go out on a press release or a or a Royal Navy trip or something, uh, they're just. I mean, I often didn't didn't see the guy from the other city <laughs> that had one. <laughs> um, you know, it depended. Uh, but I suddenly thought that's a real shame because it was a sign that defence had shrunk so far that this that this that this tough business of fighting and dying was only concentrated in certain areas and most people had no contact whatsoever with anyone in uniform. Uh, and uh, there that that gap where there is a knowledge gap it will be filled by fiction 
that's unfortunately that's you you yeah the human brain being what it is if if you can't see the real thing in your daily ex- experience to override it you will take the next source of information you'll take the next source of data which is uh shall we say unrealistic fiction and bad reporting <laughs> so yeah so i mean there is always that blurred line, um, which is why I've got such an absolute hatred of uh, sort of docudrama and things like that. Yeah, you know, either you're reporting factually or you're writing fiction. You blur the line. Uh, I just don't know where where you are. I don't know whether you're do. I, I don't know why you're doing it, but whatever you tell yourself, you're lying to the public. Whatever you're doing. Well, the, the the pieces that you extrapolate and fill in, that's where the truth of 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 your worldview, the storyteller, of the Absolutely, storyteller's yeah. worldview comes for comes in. Yes, yeah. and um, the whole thing about having a specialist. Specialists ask harder questions um, in the same way that some of the some of the things that I see our MPs do, and you just think, oh, some of the stupid things they say. I think, how do you know what you don't? How how can you be in that job and not know that you need to say, get me a researcher and find out that before I'm asked those questions? Yeah. You, I don't expect people to have an encyclopedic view of the world, but I do expect them, whether they're journalists or, or members of parliament or whatever, to know you've got to look stuff up or call someone who knows better than you do. And they're not very good at that. Um, I think it's it's a very complicated situation um, and it's difficult to separate the way journalism is from the education system. Uh, from expectations um, of of the job, uh, uh, I'm I'm just thinking if you we don't teach kids how to think, we teach them what to think, and that's right. a problem. And I know people say, "Oh no, you you don't know what you're talking about." We do all this in schools. I see evidence of it every day that kids are expecting to be told who's right and wrong. Yeah. Now there's moral guidance, and then there's um, being being told this is happening and that's good that's happening and that's bad and the, it sort of reaches the stage where i occasionally get emails from uh, younger readers when i say younger readers i don't write young adult fiction but obviously given the sort of stuff i write i get sort of teens sure and there was one lad in particular who's, who who just summed it up in a lovely line he said i've read your books but I don't know who the good guys are. Tell me who the good guys are. And I said, you, you've, that, that's your challenge. That, you've got to use your own moral compass. You've got to find your own moral compass and work out. I said, there isn't a mystery. I don't know. I know if that were happening for real, whose who side I'd take. But, you see, it never appears in the book, you see. This is what throws people. Everyone thinks I share their politics. However, I mean, this is the weird thing. Um, and that's the journalist, the old-fashioned journalist in me, that nobody knew what my politics were because I didn't see why it should be in the book because it's what the characters think that matters. And when there's not that clear authorial steer or a teacher, an English teacher saying, well, this is what the writer really means – some kids are lost. Quite a few kids are lost, and it's indicative of the, of, of the way they're taught, that they're looking for a hidden meaning that isn't there. The meaning has got to come from them and their lived lives. Well, that, that leads me to a question that, uh, that I hoped we would get to, uh, uh, to touch on. And um, as a fiction writer, and, uh, because uh, – and you alluded to this in, in what you did not say uh, – is that uh, fiction can be – one of the greatest vehicles for propaganda and to uh to inject what we think you know in a into a palatable um vehicle for people and and Absolutely. a lot of times you can Absolutely. read a novel and you come away believing things that you never would have believed any other way because it was it was cloaked in story um it so, goes under your radar absolutely yeah, right so as a novelist uh, how do you maintain that uh, objectivity and tell the story without letting uh, – you said people don't know where you stand when they come out of it. Uh, but is that, a, is that something you fight or is, that, uh, is it just the nature of the way you tell stories and, and goes back to that old school journalist that you don't need to inject everything that Karen thinks about as you write? It's, it is purely journalism. Um, it's – I can't think any other way. I can't write any other way. Uh, and, be- and bear in mind that I've been paid to do propaganda for a long time. Um, I, I don't know how much – I mean, that is quite common for journalists to jump the fence and 
and do that sort of PR. That is that is common. Um, and if you're really, really good, nobody – Nobody spots a propaganda. I mean, fic- that's why fiction's dangerous. You see, this is why fiction is dangerous, and why I treat it very carefully and with great respect. Is that I really do know how to plant a notion in someone's head, and I can watch it happen. And uh, uh, there is a, also a little bit in me that says that's wrong. You are not trained. That was not the way you were trained. Don't do that. So I will always flag up what I'm when I'm talking to someone. I will say, well. You have to bear in mind this this is this is the position I'm coming from. But in terms of what I write, it's because I'm in the characters' heads, because I let them speak, I don't twist their words. Um, again, it's quite unless you can do the dissociative thing and think like someone else, then oh and feel what they feel. It's very difficult to explain that to someone who can't do it. And it's very clear that I don't want to go <laughs> and say there are two sorts of people, because you can take any situation, there are always two sorts of people, but some excuse me. Oh, sorry, start start again. Um, it's okay. There are some people who can think the way the other guy thinks and see what he sees. And people think that's empathy. Uh, no, it can be a very hostile thing. Um, it's It could be an adversarial thing. Journalists ought to be able to think like the other guy. Otherwise, you know, you don't know really where to take your questioning. Um, think like the enemy is a classic military skill. Uh, police have to think like the bad guy. PR, you've got to think like customers. And that ability to think... It's to put yourself in that person's shoes and wonder how they're going to react. And it's very clear lots of people can't do it. Otherwise, you know, they say, surely everybody thinks this. Well, there's no surely everybody thinks anything other than that they want to be fed, have, have enough water, uh, breed, and, and, and not be subjected to pain. There are a few basic animal things. But we don't all see the world the same way. And when I dissociate, for want of a better word, and do the characters – I'm in someone else's head and it makes it's got to make perfect sense to that character. All characters make sense to themselves. This is why the sort of stereotype villain is such a drag in a movie because nobody, even, even the craziest serial killer, does not go around thinking, I'm a really crazy serial killer. Wow. <laughs> they, they just rationalize their world like we all do. I mean, we could, I, I could be totally barking mad and I wouldn't know. I mean, I could be totally mad now and I w- would not know because my world makes sense to me. And it's the nature of, <laughs> sorry, uh, it's the nature of reality, really, isn't it? We we don't really know what, what it is, but you've got to accept that um, if you're writing that character and they, and they want to do things to make them believable, you have to make them real people, which means they have to believe what they're doing. And when you're in that head, I find it's actually quite a jolt when you come out of it. Um, if I'm going to write a really difficult, nasty character from the outside, someone who's aggressive with people or, or uh, violent, I have to make sure that I come down afterwards before I go out into the supermarket, you know, because you're still <laughs> thinking like, you know, whip your axe out or something. <laughs> it's very weird. Uh, and at the end of the working day, you can just shrug them off and go, well, I'm back to being meat again now. Um, you know, if you can get inside the head of you know, a fourteen-year-old boy who's in the shadow of his, you know, extremely famous parents, or you're a ninety-two-year-old woman who's run an abs- absolutely uh, terrifying um, spy network, or you're an alien, or you're an AI, if, if you can think in those, if you can think what it's like to be that person or that thing within that body, experiencing the, the world, and you've believed it for the period that you're sat at that keyboard, then you, you you have this come down period and it's the classic cliche that you hear in um, uh, detective movies about, again, serial killers, our favorite topic. Uh, getting inside the head of a serial killer is really frightening. That I can believe is true <laughs> because there are characters whose heads I've been in and I just come out of it and think, whoa, that's not the place. I mean, they're great characters to write from a craft point of view, from an emotional point of view. It's like... I probably wouldn't want them living next door to me. And then there are others that shame me <laughs> because you think, well, that was, a really, that was a really good person. And sometimes you think, if you're in a real situation, you think, actually, that character would have done that. I really should have done it that way because that struck me looking at that character, that it was a better way to conduct your life. Um, and characters have changed my mind on really, really big moral issues. I never mention them because they're the sort of moral issues that start World War Three in any conversation (laughs) but there has been a few books i've written with some characters and i've come out of it and thought 
that opinion I've held for many years, I'm wrong. <laughs> I've got to change that right. opinion. Well, I, I, I don't write books. The books write me. <laughs> I love that. Uh, I, I actually had this conversation with someone yesterday uh, who uh, he he wrote a book and part of the book, it, it was a, a World War II uh, historical fiction, uh, but part of the book is from uh, a couple of the German officers' point of view. And, and uh, we were talking about that uh, to write a good quote-unquote villain – um, you have to understand that that everyone is the hero of their own story. Exactly. And while we are on the other side of history and can look back and we see, obviously, how things played out and the, the, the causes and, and, and where humanity went terribly wrong, uh, in that person's mind at that time, they thought they were doing what they needed to do for their uh, for themselves, their family, their community, you know, and it, it gets larger and larger. Uh, and, and, uh, those make compelling stories. Uh, when, when things are so utterly black and white, uh, it, they can get a little boring. And the, uh, I, I think the, the writer, uh, it's a dangerous place when metaphor becomes, um, allegory and, and gets really heavy handed. Mm. Absolutely. But. Yes. I mean, it's, that is a good example you've just given is that uh, you take someone who's been your existential threat, a genuine existential threat, but you can see their point of view. And anyone who's, who's uh, seen the movie or as it was a TV series when it, was re- when, when it first came out in Britain, uh, dust, dust Bolt, mm. if you didn't weep for those guys at the end, you're not a human being. Right. And yet, you know, um, I, I could... I really was upset by that uh, movie stroke series, uh, even though my uncle, uh, because my you know my father ha- had a much older brother, uh, was killed, uh, you know, died in World War Two when his when his ship was sunk by a U boat. <laughs> but I could still look at those guys, uh, knowing that and knowing how much it had distressed my dad, uh, and think they they were they were human too. Right. And to be able to convey that instead of just going as you say for the cheap stereotypes is. That's really what fiction's for. I mean, fiction has uses. It isn't just to pass on our time. But when you mention um, uh, the everyone's a hero of, of their own story, it's quite interesting to watch how the fiction world regards that. Because, I mean, from my point of view, what I've seen of the publishing world is very much that it's of the liberal left. Very, very much meaning almost universally. Uh, if you are a bit to the, if you are right of centre, then um, it's not. You're not going to find many. Well, you wouldn't have been able to find many people who were of that mindset, not working in publishing companies. They're they're not aware that they are. You know, that is their normality. That's their baseline. They're not aware they're in. They're anywhere on the spectrum. Um, but when I was at Clarion, uh, I did it, uh, the. I got into Clarion. And uh, one of the things we did, sorry, uh, for people who don't know what Clarion is, it was it was a residential workshop. Uh, um, I did mine at Michigan State University, six weeks of immersion, uh, and you write and you write and you write, and you have a different uh, tutor, uh, a different professional writer every week, and the aim is uh, to basically prepare you for a professional career. Um, and one of the things about it is that you get people from the industry come in to talk to you. And there was one managing editor who came in and she had read my stuff. And when we had a one-to-one, she said it was interesting because she felt that she had been seduced by sin. And we talked about it. And it turned out that the characters that she regarded as just the villains because they didn't agree with her politics were portrayed as human beings. And she started to see the world a little differently. <laughs> and she she used the word ambushed by it, and I and I look back on it every so often and think she had not been exposed to those views before, <laughs> and it was interesting to watch someone who had probably read thousands of manuscripts actually struck by this. Well, and and our our social media culture doesn't help uh, that because we get the most complex issues. Uh, distilled down and, uh, and, 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 you know, dried down to its, the, the very basest, um, 
uh, you know, uh, two, two syllable, uh, stances yeah. on things. And, Absolutely. and, and that doesn't help our, uh, our ability to, uh, to feel empathy for other people and to, uh, to uh, sh- stop talking long enough to listen to what people are saying. Yes. I mean, again, um, I was, I go back to the education system and right. I, I know, I mean, we're talking about two different countries here and, uh, you know, two different civilizations effectively, but we, we have more in common than we have that separates us. Absolutely. And one of the things that strikes me is the easy answer sort of uh, um, multiple choice thinking. And a friend of mine who had, who had worked, um, sorry, this is an American guy who had worked for all the big uh, computer companies, um, said that he noticed it when he was recruiting is that uh, as he was getting generations come through that. Uh, they were looking for uh, yes, no answers all the time. He said it's very binary, and that's that's the thing is binary thinking. And we're encouraging people to think that there is a right an- answer, and there's always a right answer if only they look hard enough. And yeah, grey areas are not taught. Um, changing views are not taught. Uh, uh, Humanising. Well, well, not, not only are changing views not taught. If we have a politician who uh, stood one way five years ago and now stands a different way. We call them flip floppers yeah. and we have these horrible names and, and, uh, I, I don't believe the things now that I believe or, you know, some of them, uh, my, my views have grown and changed. And I, Absolutely. I actually want, I actually want someone who can take new information and, and take a better decision based on that. Absolutely. I, I admire people who say, I, I now feel I was wrong. I should have done this because it means yeah. they've looked at things, but defending your, your, your position, even when you you must surely know that the facts have changed, uh, is a frightening thing. And I I know we have an absolute need to be part of a tribe, and we have a need to norm. And even I mean even on factual things like me, I mean the classic example is, and I've actually seen the video of it of an experiment where uh, a student doesn't know everyone else is set up uh, to basically do the uh, to do this stunt, but he's he draw, he's told to draw a line that's six, exactly six in, in inches long. And then people lean over him and say, yeah, now that's five in, inches. And he starts off saying, well, it's six inches. And they say, no, 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 that's five. And eventually he falls in that it's a five-inch line, even though it's abundantly clear it's six in, in, inches. And <laughs> however crazy that looks, and everyone says, isn't that stupid? I'd never fall for it, yet 90% probably would. Um, and we absolutely need to agree and we need to fit in. Otherwise... You know, because that's how we've survived. And the ability to norm and to agree with our neighbours and not fight, but to come together as a as a sort of herd or a troop or whatever is is why we're where we are. Why we are where we are today. So that's terrific. But sometimes, you know, there comes a point where everyone realises that that the that the ideology has overtaken the facts. And when ordinary people start saying, "Hang on, look, you can't ignore that." what's happened there we must take account of that then i think that's when they start to lose patience everyone reaches a, a point uh, where what they're told does not fit what they're experiencing and that's that's where it falls down absolutely absolutely um yes yeah, sorry well, i totally got you off i, I was uh, no, totally rambling no, on the wrong thing there but no, this whole no. business of the sort of multiple choice uh, way we educate people reducing arguments to uh, very simple things, and if you are of this particular set of um, uh, political or or uh, social beliefs, then you must tick all these boxes. You can't deviate in the middle. You can't have grey areas. You're you're either with us or or you're the en- enemy. You see that so often, and uh, it does concern me because it has now impinged on fiction uh, so much pressure that. Not just we don't like people writing certain things that don't fit our cosy world, but we try to stop them. And there is an right. increasing pressure on that. That you must, you must do this in a TV drama series. You must do this in a comedy series. You must do this in a novel. You're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to write those sorts of characters. I wish they realised, if they even care, how dangerous that is. Fiction is where we go safely mad. Fiction <laughs> is where we is where we ask the unaskable and say the unsayable and try out the ideas that if we did them in our experimental area, they're where we make sense of our you know, it's back to sitting around the campfire in primitive days and the uh, the tribal storyteller tells stories. It's about 
understanding our world, putting our fears in place, but also saying, what if? If you, if you limit that, that has got to go somewhere and it goes into nasty places. It doesn't go away. It just manifests itself in a very bad practical way. I wish these people would understand that we need this safety valve. And the more you try and shut that down, the worse it's going to get. Absolutely. And uh, you write, uh, like you mentioned earlier, military fiction, uh, but also science fiction and and military sci-fi, you know, which uh, is is the the hybrid that a lot of our favorite science fiction uh, uh, Mm -hmm. comes from. Uh, What what was it about science fiction in particular uh, that really piqued your interest and got you to writing in that genre? Um, it was a, another fairly prosaic uh, decision that I made about um, when I did my business plan. Uh, I thought, right, uh, how do people make careers? They make them in genre because people like series. One-off books you might get awards for, but they're not going to pay the rent unless you get a sort of huge uh, advance and you know, never write another book. And there are a few of those around, but for most of us, if you're looking for an income, if you're looking for a career, you're looking at genre. Um, and people like characters. And I thought, what can I do? What can I do that will sustain whole series? Because I didn't have a burning story in me. I didn't have a novel in me waiting to get out. I was looking for something to write about. And as a journalist, well, it, it's a matter of you will, you can take anything you're given and make something out of it and work up an enthusiasm for it to find out more. So um, I actually used to, I, I liked science fiction um, as a kid. Uh, from a very early age, and I can remember, and what, when, you know, when I talked earlier about going back to being five and having, having a very early memory, my early memory, oddly enough, was a BBC series um, called A for Andromeda. And if you've heard the sound change there, it's because I've ha- I've sort of moved across to my bookcase where I actually have both the paperback and what was left of the TV series because they threw away so so many of the of the of the film reels over the years and it was rescued later. But I was five, and I was fascinated by this black and white TV screen with this with this with this, with this galaxy on it, uh, which was a title sequence. And I was watching TV with my mum, and I, I said, "What's Andromeda?" And she said. And bear in mind, my mother left school at, at 14 and was not an, ed, not an educated woman. She said, it's stars that are so far away, the light takes a million years to reach you. I've never forgotten that. And every time I say it, sorry, it makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. But, um, um, and I watched this series. I, I know I watched it, but I didn't remember anything of it. Uh, until a few years ago, I... I heard that they had managed to recover quite a lot of the original film and were going to put it on DVD. And I watched it again, or what there was of it, because some of it is actual episodes and some is production stills because they didn't have the footage in, anymore with just the audio. And what struck me was how much, how many questions in there were things that I still deal with today. And one was... Uh, one was about uh, what the military were asked to do because basically A for Andromeda is about um, it was actually written by Fred Hoyle who obviously was an astronomer so he, he, he so knew his stuff so having said that I now feel the urge to check it but I'm pretty sure that's what it is I'm sure one of your listeners will tell me if I'm wrong but basically um, aliens contact us and sent a blueprint uh, to create a life form um, in the form of a very human looking female and it all goes badly wrong. Uh, and I don't remember any of the badly wrong bit. But all the themes were there about what we expect of the military, what aliens think of us, uh, corruption, people making terrible errors of assumption about what aliens want and what other people want. And it was fascinating. If you ever think your five-year-old is not taking in things on the telly because they're too adult, they are. <laughs> they are taking that in and they are asking those questions. So anyway... Um, I used to think that I was quite a reader because I had read a few books. Um, I actually read almost nothing, and it and it and it took a friend who, um, uh, in fact, it's Farrah Mendelssohn, um, who is uh, who's a, she's a reviewer. Um, she's an academic as well, but uh, she's you know she actually when she'd go through a list of books and so and she's actually you've not really read that many books. I said no, I actually don't like I didn't like reading, 
Um, but obviously, compared to the background I came from, I was actually quite well read because I've read two or three. Uh, but I was very much more movies um, and TV and radio. And uh, certainly watching 2001 when the film came out was extraordinary. As a, you know, Watching that as a kid, uh, I think that's, that did have an impact on me because it was all questions. It made me ask questions. So that's really a science fiction thing plus – jumping back to what you take from your working life is that um, because I'd, I'd, I'd been a defence correspondent, grown up in a naval town, um, most of my family had seen, uh, had sort of seen service at some point or other. Uh, I'd done, a, done, a, done, a, done some time in the reserves. I mean, I was never re- re- regular or full time. Um, and I think, right, there are issues that come out of that which are very relevant to science fiction. And also having spent 10, 10 nearly 11 years uh, plus journalistic involvement with, with the political world. Now, that was, <laughs> that was the gold mine. And somehow I thought, well, I'm sure I can put all those together and actually make a series out of it. And that's where City of Pearl came from. And that's where the whole Wessar series came from because it had military, it had politics, it had aliens with different ex- expectations of us. And I thought, I can sustain that for at least six books. And that's what I need. Now, now all I've got to do is build characters that will grab people because when I did my research and said, why do you buy this book? I, I would just stop people. I'd go in the bookstores. I'd ask them questions. You know, piss people in the shop, just get stuck of a conversation or, or I'll ask around at work and say, why do you read the books you read? And it struck me that people are not or are frequently not into the actual plot, uh, but they do love the characters. Now, I obsess over plot. And thriller readers are a lot more picky about it um, because obviously it hinges on on clues and things. Uh, but that's it. I mean, it it was a very me- mechanistic decision on my on my part. It was stuff where I had sufficient knowledge to be able to know what further questions and further research I, I should do. And here we are. Well, talking about uh, the the things to bring to to the genre, uh, no matter what the genre is, when you get a collection of people, uh, there will be politics. And and if yeah. we're talking about a, a new frontier that we're exploring, there will be military. Uh, th- those things are, are are given whether you're you're writing science fiction or fantasy I mean, or you know or, or whatever. So I think I'm losing you a bit. Um, oh, I didn't oh. quite catch that. Yeah, sorry. I think we've got a sound problem. Oh, oh no. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. I, I was just saying that uh, when you're talking about the, the elements to bring to the story, uh, whenever you get a collection of people, there will be politics. And if we're exploring a new uh, a new frontier, uh, if we can borrow that from Star Trek, uh, there will be military and there will be a military presence. There will be conflict. Uh, so uh, those things work no matter what genre you're you're uh, looking at, really. Absolutely. I mean, the, the whole thing about military um, fiction is that if is if you do it on honestly, um, then it's the ultimate human experience in in, in terms yeah. of tribe, in the sense of belonging, in the sense of being bonded with people. Uh, it's it's I mean. It's different to the civilian world. You don't put your life in, 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 your, in your next door neighbor's hands very often in this world, whereas you do uh, in the army or the navy. And it's that trust and it's that bond and it's that common purpose and it's that also selflessness. But, but it's looking, at, you know, looking out for the guy next to you the, to a degree that we, we've really lost in modern life. And that's a very powerful thing. But, you know, you, what you've said about uh, you get a group of people together and you know that <laughs> there's going to be some sort of conflict, inevitably. Right. Um, I mean, when there are two things uh, that really drive the plots. I mean, I don't come up with a plot first. I mean, people say, you know what it's like. You're at a party or you're having dinner and someone says, um, oh, I, oh uh, uh, what do you do? And you say, well, actually, I'm a, I'm a novelist. And they go, oh, I've got a great idea for a story. And you try sort of tactfully to say, well, I've got millions that are never going to get written because I've got a list building on my desk. It's not that. It's how you tell it. And they find it hard to believe that you don't come up with a plot first. Well, I know lots of writers do, but I come up with the – I look at an environment and then I decide what people would logically be there. As you say, if it's if it's a mission to uh, a foreign planet, you're going to have some military. You're going to have some sort of security presence. You're going to have scientists. You're going to have – 
this, that and the other. Uh, so you can define the sort of people who would go on these sorts of missions or be in this sort of situation and then you can build the characters from there. And what I do is when I've got the characters, I then see how they in- interact. It's much more like um, a computer model uh, or a video game because it, it's because it's interactive and it's non-linear in my head. Now, that's not to say that I don't start thinking, I think the story is going to end here because you can't get on a train not knowing where, where you're going. But you can get off at a station that looks interesting and take another train somewhere else. And that's how I write. It's basically, I think I'm going there. You know, if I sort of start at Portsmouth Harbour and I think I'm going to Waterloo, but um, we end up at, at Petersfield and I think, you know, I think I'm going to get off at Petersfield, take take that train somewhere else and see what's over there. And that's the way the story goes is the characters take you off at different stations and they go places you weren't expecting and they do things that you wouldn't do as a human, as, as an individual human being. And the number of times characters have automatically done things in my stories and I've thought, that's not nice. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> and I've really been quite shocked and offended by them. And I think, no, no, that's when it's working. But it is quite, it is quite disconcerting. It, it's an ex- exploration process. You don't get the answers from them that you would give or that you expect them to give. Right. Um, you you have written for some of the the biggest and most uh, widely recognized um, franchises uh, in, in fiction and military fiction. Uh, and you also write your own series. You, you mentioned the Weshar series earlier and uh, uh, the, the Ringer series, mm-hmm. which you are now in the midst of. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, it sounds to me, uh, from what you said earlier, that even if you're writing in someone else's universe and, and playing in their sandbox, if it were, uh, it sounds to me that you bring the same uh, sensibilities to building character and situations, uh, no matter if it's your own series or someone else's. It, it, is that fair to say? Oh, yes. I mean, I, I can only write one way. <laughs> that's, that's, that's my method, and that's what I stick to. Um, in that sense, I am a one-trick pony. I am, I am never going to write a totally different way. Uh, uh, the reason I ended up doing... Um, a lot of this uh, work for hire was after my first novel came uh, well actually before my first novel came out uh, which was City of Pearl in 2004 um, various editors had seen that I think someone had seen it before it came out and I got a call saying would you like to write X, Y and Z for us and I, I didn't have a clue about time and fiction but I I needed the money because I was looking for a different career so I said yeah that sounds fine I'll do that and um either I lived a charmed life or they were relieved that someone would pick it up and run with it. But I was never really given a sort of strict, you will write. No one ever told me what to write. I just, I didn't know I was supposed to even ask. I just wrote them a story. And obviously I uh, started off with, um, the, the first thing I did was, uh, was related to a game. I wouldn't say it was based on a game, but obviously I'd work with the game people in terms of, I'd, I'd go back to them and say, look, um, because no one gave me any canon for the first thing I wrote for, until I was about three or four books in. They didn't tell me that there was actually something, an actual document that they, they, they could have given me with all the questions <laughs> in. Um, I mean, that's that's publishing for you, but we'll talk about that later. But, yeah, I mean, I basically approach everything the same way. And the reason people asked me to do these was because they could see what I wrote and they just said, give me a Karen Travis book, give me a Karen Travis series. Now, there are, I've been asked by many others to write for them, and within the first five seconds of having a conversation, I can tell whether I will work for them or not, because rightly or wrongly, once you get into the habit of doing that, if someone says, well, actually, we'll, we'll, um, we'd love you to write for us, and I won't even name this company, but um, first of all, they would only deal with me through the ed- editor. Well, if I can't look someone in, in the eye, met, you know, metaphorically speaking, over the phone or talk to them, um, I already think the relationship is starting to not look a particularly good one in the first five seconds. Uh, and then I, uh, they say, well, we've already, got, we've already got the story. What we want you to do is no, that's not how I write. I can't do that. If you've decided what the story is, you need a different sort of writer to basically put into words what's in your head. I do an exploratory process. I don't know where it's going to end. I'm like, we, can, we can guess and we can talk about it as I go, but... I'm not going to write your story for you. You have to find another sort of writer to do that. If you want me to come up with a story, that's what I do because I've got to find the characters through. This is why I don't uh, do joint books with anyone because it's all in my head. I have to construct this reality 
I have to construct these different uh, these different mi- mindsets I switch between of the different characters. I have to juggle the causality of their worlds and how they see it, because a lot of what drives the plot for me is they all see the world differently. They get if you if you look at my books, they are very much here's a situation. Everybody knows what it is. There's no mystery to it, but they don't see it the same way, and they do different things. And as a reader said to me, I want to stand behind some of your characters going, no, 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 that's not what's happening. Don't do that. It's all going to end in tears. But <laughs> that's what real people do. We all see the world the same way pretty much in terms of the input, but how we process it gives us a totally different view of it. And that's where my plot comes from, which is why I say to people, don't give me your story. Ask me to come in and write your story for you. Build your story for you. I can do that, but I can't write your story because – I will fall over at the first hurdle. And, uh, you know, there have been quite a few people like that who thought, well, that we've, you know, we've sort of seen the sales and, and we know what she can do. Let's get her in. But then they don't understand that the price of that is you let me do it. <laughs> you let me loose. Exactly. Um, I, I, I heard some news recently that uh, I, I think when you finish your, uh, your Ringer series uh, that you're going to – uh, write some books in the Galaxy's Edge universe. Is, is um, there some some truth to that? Yes. Sorry. Um. Yeah. Sorry. Can I stop there and just go back to something? Um. I mean. Yeah. Ab- absolutely. Um, I was. I mean. I was also going to say, the whole thing about creating something is much the same for games and comics. Although, obviously, with games and comics, uh, you're working with a different team, um, and that is enjoyable too. Funnily enough, uh, I don't necessarily need. Uh, to have my own my own story, my own view there. It's a lot of fun bouncing ideas off people, as long as they're from different disciplines. Um, working with artists, uh, some of the some of the best stories that I've ever uh, stumbled over, shall we say, are when I've looked at someone's artwork and I thought, oh, I can see that in the background. I think I can build a story on that. Um, at the moment, I'm partway through a, a comic series, which uh, should be out at some time, although I think they've had to shift the date, uh, called um, Fury, Fury's Key. I'm working with Steve Kerth and, as, as, as the artist. Oh, nice. um, Steve and I did uh, a G.I. Joe run together. And, I mean, I've always been very, very lucky with artists. I've always had really great guys. Um, the first, I mean, when I've the very first comic I did was for Gears of War, and I had Colin Wilson. I mean, that's like getting a Rolls Royce as soon as you pass your driving test. It's fantastic, you know. So I've been always been lucky. But I mean, Steve and I particularly gelled well, and I've sort of learned with Steve that he, although I do very tightly directed scripts, and I and because I I write them in sort of TV way because I spent time as a TV journalist, so I virtually do a storyboard. So I know when I've handed it, it, it to Steve, what I will get back on the pencils is something that I didn't see coming. And there'll be little characters in the background and there'll be some that are, I just, oh, Steve, that, that guy at the back there. And in fact, there's one we call young, young Ron Burgundy because this guy just looked like young Ron Burgundy. And I said, <laughs> save him, please, please. You know, can we just save him for later because I've got a role for him. And you can write these characters up and he's got these, he's got a way of looking at the world that, I mean, Separately, we can probably tell quite quite good stories on, on our own in our own medium. You put us together, and we strike sparks off each, off each other. And I sort of got that with um, with Gears because I did well. Obviously, you know, I did the Gears novels. I also did Gears comics. I also wrote the third game. Working with really creative artists and sound people, they see the world differently. They see different aspects of the world, and that's exciting. Now, I, I don't get that with writers. <laughs> that's the weird thing, um, which is why I can't write a book with someone. Right. Um, but I can write alongside artists, mu- musicians, model makers, you name it, and because something else happens there. There's some different chemistry. Um, I've I've told this story before, so you know this is this is this is one of the many things that you can cut out <laughs> for length. But <laughs> just to show you what happens when you've got a common view between different creatives. When I was working on Gears. Uh, and the visuals were just stunning. I mean, it really is a remarkably beautiful game and a fantastically visualized universe. Just beautiful. And when I was writing, I think it was the second novel, first novel, I had a scene in my mind in uh, Prescott's office. Prescott was, it, it was effectively the head of state. 
Uh, and he was a great politician to write because he didn't come over in the games as being a particularly charming character, but I was able to explore why he did what he did, and he made sense to himself. And he actually, I don't see what other choices he had by the time I got to the end of the series, but I had this strong image of his office, and there was a very strong visual style to the game and a very strong architectural style. Anyway, I never described the office in the book, but in the next game, they had done a scene with the office. And I looked at this, the, his office and I thought, that rug's wrong. And I said to the artist, I think it's an Indian rug, not a Chinese one. And then we both stopped. And it was this weird moment when I thought, but we visualized the same 99% of the same room without knowing what was in the other person's head. <laughs> and it was such a strong style. And everyone was so attuned to each other in this i mean so this is a hundred people working on a game absolutely extraordinary it was like this hive mind we had and we as to this day i have not worked out what the cognitive uh side of this is how human brains can do this but the feeling when you were sat down having a meeting or you'd go and look at someone's art or they'd come and look at your script is you it was like we'd all really lived there but had forgotten it and that one person had remembered and suddenly we were all going, oh, yeah, do you remember that? And that was what it was like. It was like it was almost like a false memory. It was bizarre and wonderful. And I knew at the time nothing else would ever come close to that as a creative experience. And I'm really glad I went through it because it just showed you what the human mind can do. And especially humans working together and don't even know how we're working together. But we come up with something much bigger than you know, the sum of the parts. Amazing. Uh, it just it shows that uh, how how beautiful and terrifying this uh, this human existence oh, is, and so much we yeah. we just don't understand yeah. ab- about our 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 day to day workings. Um, oh man! Yes, yeah, so uh, I sort of cut you off when you were talking about Galaxy's Gal- oh, Gal- oh, oh no 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 that that's fine. I know I, I I'm glad yeah. you did because uh, that's uh, uh, that, that's a, a crucial part in, in talking about. Uh, working in, in different disciplines and uh, I see that uh, all the time too it's, it's almost like when you're working with another writer uh, you start spitballing ideas and, and all of a sudden you've kind of lost the plot but when you work with an artist that, that sees the world differently than you do um, magic can happen it's, it's crazy absolutely absolutely yeah. and sometimes it can be the smallest detail I mean um I had really almost semi-retired. I had almost given up writing, uh, mainly because uh, um, when my mother uh, was very ill and she eventually died of cancer and uh, oh, then so my, almost immediately afterwards my father uh, had a stroke. So I had quite a few years when uh, there was just too much going on uh, in my domestic life you know family life to to really write at the rate that i used to and it coincided with uh you know just as just as i was having all these problems all these family problems um traditional publishing had reached the stage where uh sorry i'll start again um uh a few years ago my mother was uh, very ill she eventually died of cancer uh my father almost immediately had a stroke uh, after that. So I had a few very rough uh, sort of domestic problem years. Unfortunately, it coincided with me absolutely running out of patience with traditional publishing, um, <laughs> which, uh, you know, just – they basically uh, did all the wrong things at a very wrong time for me. And I thought, you know what? I can't be doing this in- anymore. I had, I didn't need the income. I, I, I sort of – because I've been fairly sensible, I found that I actually could – just give up work and although I did actually carry on working it was under a very different circumstances because I, I just had enough so I, I I actually had a book in production with one publisher uh I hadn't actually uh I don't think it had been no I don't think it had been set at that stage no sorry I had a book in production with one publisher and I said you know what I want my book back here here's your money back I've had enough sorry that's it index and I decided to um, 
go for self-publishing. I mean, I, I actually had all the I had all the relevant technical skills, and I thought, well, you know, I don't need to take this. I'm right at my end end of end of my tether because you know because of the family situation. And the book I took away was Ringer series. Uh, the first one was um, Going Going Grey. And although I wasn't writing at the pace I used to write because I was used to doing four books a year and it was a real struggle to get one out in a year, I I published it myself um, and it was a very painless experience and I thought, why didn't I think of doing this scene out? Because it's, a, it's an awfully big risk to take when you're used to doing advance. But I thought, no, I'm going to do it this way. And I think that was a bit of a life changer. You know, my father was, father's health was declining and he passed about a year ago. So I haven't got as many books out as I would have done. And the next one was Black Run and, and that's, that's the current one. Um, they are, they're not, I, some people say they're science fiction. Some people say they're techno thrillers. They're listed under both in, in the Amazon category. Uh, it's the, it's the here and now it's on a, it, it's real people um in real countries rather than aliens but there is a science angle and uh there's genetic engineering and that sort of thing so although it's more of a classical thriller uh, people who've people who've read say my halo stuff um can get into it um because they see the same sort of dynamics go- going on and the same moral issues uh, i'm actually continuing with that series um well for as long as um writing sacrificial which is book three at the moment um I was also going to branch out genre-wise a little bit further, and I have got what I well a, a fantasy, <laughs> which is very unusual for me, but it's not not the usual sort of fan fantasy that you might expect, but a more sort of like um, yeah, magic realism. Uh, so while I was sort of coasting along here, thinking, well, I shall I shall spend my declining years doing the odd book here and there, and you know, because I don't, yeah, you know, just need it to top up my basic level of income. Um, and of course, the real pleasure of not having to dance to traditional publishing's tune or put up with all the bureaucracy and all the nonsense, and uh, you know, really not worry about who you offend either, which is great because <laughs> <laughs> I am a bit gobby, you know. Um, and that was really uh, how I was sort of coding along, and of course, doing the odd comic when I got a call from sorry, when I got a message from Jason Ansbach, and I. You know, and he, and he put a sort of proposal to me. And initially, I thought, do I want to go back to writing science fiction? Do I want to do this? But I liked Jason, and we got on. We talked for a long time, and I thought, well, actually, yeah. I mean, this is in this is what indie should be doing. And we, what we were talking about was a collaboration. That, uh, um, because my big horror is writing for someone else, work for hire. I would, I would rather live in a hedge than do that again. So, sorry, <laughs> it's nothing to do with the output because, and, and also, you know, you've got terrific loyal readers who will follow you from series to series, but the internal politics of working with things like that, I, I just can't be doing with it. I'm too old and too cranky now. I just don't want to put up with it anymore. But when you're with another in indie uh, and they understand what the game is and you're not um, – within that sort of corporate politics thing that you get with big publishing, it suddenly starts to look very different. And I said, well, you know, you, you, you realize what a sort of free range chicken I am. I'm quite a difficult <laughs> at this stage of my life to then write within someone else's, um, you know, it's, it's established, uh, sort of story again. You know, if I've got a little corner that I can explore, it's totally different. He said, yeah, sure. We can do that. We can do that. And without going into too much detail, cause this will spoil the story. Right. I think there's one thing he said that re- there was just one line in a throwaway conversation we had, and I suddenly thought, I want to know, I want to know the background to that. I want to know <laughs> how eventually things reach that stage, and I think I can a- answer that question. And it's something that made me both um, sort of outraged and extremely am- amused, and that's always a good sign. If, if it you know, if it makes me laugh and think, oh yeah, now that's trouble. Um, that's a great idea for a story. So that's it. what I'm going to be doing. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm still continuing with my thriller stuff, and uh, fingers crossed I will continue with uh, comics uh, and maybe ex- expand my genres. But I'm going to do a few books uh, in a collaboration with uh, Galaxy's Edge, and we'll, and we'll, we'll see what happens. 
Well, I, uh, I, of course, I'm a fan of your, uh, of your earlier science fiction that you wrote, uh, but I have fallen in love with your thriller series. I absolutely love it. Uh, and, uh, I have known, uh, Jason and Nick, uh, uh, for, from before Galaxy's Edge, uh, really was a thought. I, I knew both of these guys and what wonderful, fantastic guys they are. And to, to have gotten to sit back and watch, galaxy's edge grow over the last year uh has been just phenomenal and uh when jason told me that you were coming on uh i just got really excited because uh kind of some of my my favorite people from all around are coming together to do something that i know is going to be uh just phenomenal so uh, i i couldn't be more excited and i know a lot of people are really excited about the news as well yeah i mean jason and nick have done an, an incredible job i mean they, they really have uh, made some fantastic in, in, inroads into, I think, what people used to think was was the sort of preserve of billion dollar companies. Sure, you know, yeah. building a franchise. You know, uh, I think that that appeals to me too. I mean, that's a sort of uh, <laughs> that's a sort of aw- awkward awkward bugger a- a- aspect to me. I thought, yeah, indies <laughs> indies building franchises. I like this. This is sort of giant. Going, right. I love this. Oh. Let's get in, into this. And you see, the, the thing about it. Some people can suffer for their art and hate writing and be happy that they've got a book at the end of it. I've got to like it on a daily basis, and I've got to like the people I work with. <laughs> and I really get on with Jason and Nick, and we are of a, of a very similar mind. And that's, that's, that's fun, because if you're enjoying yourself on a daily basis, it shows in the product. Well, and, uh, you know, as much as we, we lament uh, what the Internet has done to social discourse, and we talked about it earlier, the, the social media kind of dumbing down. Um, by the same uh, token, uh, the Internet has opened up uh, a world for indies and, and allowed us to communicate, collaborate, uh, publish uh, in ways that we never have before. And uh, so just when you think that all hope is lost, uh, you know, something great happens. <laughs> oh, ab- absolutely. I mean, try – Always, I mean, I don't want to slag off traditional publishing. It's got its particular beat. But purely from my prejudice point of view, I have to sit there and think, other than controlling the distribution, what value does it add? Exactly. Once you open up the distribution, uh, the sort of um, entry barrier is very low because you don't have to have an enormous amount of money. And, I mean, I was sort of trying to explain to someone the, the, the other day, said, why did you do this? Why did you go indie? And I said... Yes, it's running away from something because you'd had enough of the bureaucracy and you'd had enough of, if I may uh, borrow um, Scott Adams' wonderful Dilbert line, um, that you're their ninth most important resource are after carbon paper. Um, <laughs> you do feel that as an author. And even someone like me with a, a dozen bestsellers, uh, you, they just forget you're there. Now, some all oh right. There are there are the same smattering of unpleasant people in any in industry. So it's not that it's full of evil people, but they seem to have, traditional publishing has lost sight of two things: the reader and the writer. They don't seem to understand um, that the writer's there because they're not physically in their office with them. And a lot of people work remotely, but the writer really is in another galaxy as far as they're concerned. And the sort of I have to tell you this story because nobody believes me when I tell them, but it happened to me more than once. Um, the the New York Times bestsellers list, if if I remember correctly, uh, would come out on a Wednesday, which would be Wednesday night U- UK time. And there was an occasion when I got uh, I got an email from another publisher, from an editor I knew, saying, "Oh, I see you made the list again." And I said, "What?" And they they had to tell me that I, that I had a had another bestseller because my own publisher didn't think to tell me and i saw their emails of them congratulating each other all through the production process and it's like yeah but do you remember that thing that you you know the little wordy bits on the paper you know the actual book yeah that was me can someone just tell me can someone factor me into the process and it's really quite funny because they, they 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 actually forget where the product is and of course they also seem incredibly focused on retailers and they forget there's a reader and that, to me, was the beauty of the in- indie world, is that the whole publishing structure is an overhead. <laughs> and I don't think they see themselves as an o- overhead. But now we're talking direct to readers, and we're, and we're reaching readers through the technology. Now, admittedly, he who controls the technology 
also controls the market. So you you are reliant to a certain extent on the goodwill of people people like 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 Amazon, but that changes too. The point is this genie won't go back in the bottle. And people say, oh, it's difficult to be visible. It's very difficult to be visible when you're with traditional publishing. If you, I mean, I sort of say this for people who might be thinking, oh, perhaps, yeah, perhaps I should have gone to traditional publishing. Perhaps I should get an agent. That's, that's a whole podcast. But, uh, you know, if you think that your publisher is going to put a lot of money into marketing your book and keep you fully informed all the time about everything, dream on. It doesn't work that way. It might work for a handful of people, but even for someone like me, uh, you know, your book will vanish and it will be off the shelves in, in, a, in a bookstore if it doesn't perform in a matter of weeks or a couple of months at most or in, or in airports a few hours. Uh, you know, it is just as hard. The difference is <coughs> that you control if you're an indie, you get to make those choices and you get to see what's happening. You don't have any nasty surprises or doubts about whether your statement is correct. Uh, you don't spend months trying to get hold of uh, someone um, you know, just to an- answer questions. Uh, you don't have to you, – you're not encouraged to actually do your own promotion for someone else's company to make the profit. And you also see most of the money and it's transparent and you know, it is worth the pain. It is definitely worth the pain of having to do things yourself and uh, not be able to. Uh, I mean, obviously, if you if you are doing well, then you can afford to farm out a, a lot of work. But a lot will be done yourself, and that's the nature of, of being a small business. But if you think your problems will be solved by going to traditional publishing, um, it won't be. <laughs> You're absolutely right. And a- after doing uh, more than 360 episodes of this show with traditional published uh, authors and indies uh that that is the case uh if you're not doing the promotion yourself it's not getting promoted and you might as well do it indie because you're doing absolutely. all the work anyway yeah absolutely um, karen uh this has been such a great joy to talk with you um if people want to follow along with what's coming up next and to dig into your back catalog where can they find you online uh, if you go to my website, that's uh, karentravis.com. And remember, it's got two S's, dot com, all one word, all lowercase. And uh, you can uh, sort of jump off from there. I'm also on Facebook and I'm on Twitter. And Twitter's, Twitter's more the real me rather than the professional me because I always forget <laughs> to pimp my books, but I do have a, a very good rant every day. <laughs> and I feel better for having a rant. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, Karen, thank you so much for being so very generous with your time. Uh, we wish you much, uh, much continued success on the Ringer series and we look forward to what's coming up next. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you. It's been enormous fun and, uh, it's been, and, and it's been great to talk to another indie. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleave's The Jason Crane Series. I was walking through the woods between Wolfert's Roost and the future site of my father's stone manor house. The house would eventually stand on what had been old Baltus's pumpkin field, the land where I had found my grandfather's head. Father had chosen the spot for its view of the Hudson River. Knoll was to be a grand mansion in the Gothic Revival style, but at the time the mansion was but a few foundations of Van Brunt stone. I had become fond of the place already, the idea of it, and I spent many a night alone in a shack on the property. My mother disapproved. She would have me sleep in the room across from hers in our townhouse. But I was fifteen and did not answer to her. I kept a bottle of spirits hidden in the crook of two walnut trees near old Baltus's grave, I thought he would approve of the gesture. I had stopped along my way to fetch it out. At the moment the first pull of liquor touched my throat, I heard a ghastly, inhuman laugh. I was not alone in the woods. Had God sent the horseman after me? Had I sinned that terribly? I ran through the wood and found the field where Knoll was to be built. The outline of the foundations was barely discernible beneath the snow. An apparition stood there. Though I have seen him many times since, I shall never forget my first glimpse. Gaunt in moonlight, headless, exuding power and malice. A magic thing in the land of the ordinary. 
the headless horseman of Sleepy Hollow. What chills those words evoke. It charged at me, hatchet raised. I stood transfixed, unable to move, unable to even imagine escape. This was the servant of God, after all, sent to strike down sinners. I hurled the bottle from my hand, ashamed that I had become a drunkard as Baltus had been. It shattered against the foundations of Knoll. I stretched out my arms and awaited judgment. A piercing white light broke the darkness. The horse reared. Not my Dylan, cried Agatha, appearing from the wood. She held a skull in her hand. It shone brightly as a diamond. And in that moment I understood. The horseman did not serve God. He served my grandmother. Perhaps in that moment I came to see Agatha and God as one and the same. The unholy spirit fought her command. A foreleg of the demon horse struck my head with such power that I fell backwards with a cry and knew no more. I carry the scar to this day. A slight indentation in my temple, barely noticeable. In my days of courting I was told that when I am angry the patch of insulted skullbone will stand out in a disturbing manner. I have never had occasion to see this phenomenon, however, as I am generally well pleased whenever I pass a mirror. <laughs>